right so here we here's where we stopped right we said that intensity is uh, a star into a a star and we said that provided the result first we said that when you lock n number of modes together so that their phase difference is not a function of time then you get pulsed operation repetition rate is not a function of number of pulses that are locked pulse width is that is an important take home message see repetition rate is 2l by c all that is important there is what is l l tells you what the repetition rate will be right but pulse width that is where number of modes come in so now uh, let us see how so we start our somewhat sketchy discussion of mode locking i apologize for the quality of slides uh, slides that will uploaded will hopefully be better i try to uh, do things quickly and this is another moral lesson that you do when you try to do things quickly they don't work out to be very good okay so as we said in the previous module we don't really have plane waves we have damped oscillation but then eventually the way we go from time domain to frequency domain is a fourier transformation and the beauty of fourier transformation is that to get the correct information about frequencies it does not matter if you take a plane wave or a damped wave because they get separated so that makes the mathematics a little easier otherwise we'd have another damping uh, factor here so we are going to work with plane waves where we'll say that this electric field is a function of time and is given by e0 the amplitude maximum amplitude into e to the power i omega t what is omega yes angular frequency omega is angular frequency what is the relationship between uh, omega and nu frequency and angular frequency 2 pi now just uh, all you have to know is whether to multiply by 2 pi or divide by 2 pi it's not very difficult right i think we know it okay so now what i'm saying is i have locked these modes together and uh, i'm saying the number of modes that i'm working with capital n is equal to 2n plus 1 so i'm working with an odd number of modes uh, because the math becomes little easier as you'll see in the next step if i have uh, an odd number of modes it doesn't matter even if it is an even number of modes you can conveniently neglect one right because remember how many modes are we going to have 5000 6000 10000 20000 20, something like that okay so it doesn't matter whether it is 20532 or 20531 so we formulate using 2n plus 1 number of modes okay so here we are saying that from one mode to the next there is a uh, difference in frequencies right and we have worked out the expression earlier what is delta nu delta nu remember delta nu what is delta nu it is difference between the frequency of nth and the n plus 1th longitudinal mode what is it what is the expression c by 2l it's going to be handy remember don't forget that that's very important c by 2l which is inverse of round trip time you told me right c by 2l so what is going to be delta omega what is delta omega going to be you know delta nu delta nu is c by 2l what will, what will delta omega be that factor of 2 pi will come right we are going to use this so don't get confused so this is what we are writing e0 into e to the power i omega 0 plus k delta omega q okay t what is k k is a number that varies from minus n to plus n so now you already see why i want 2n plus 1 number of modes it becomes nice symmetric uh, symmetrically distributed about a mean about a central position not mid central position okay plus we are saying k into delta phi q what is this delta phi q phase difference and that is independent of time let us remember that that is 
very important. So, uh, how do I expand it? I can uh, well e to the power a plus b is equal to e to the power a multiplied by e to the power b. So, I can use that and I can take this e 0 e to the power i omega 0 t outside the summation and then inside I am left with e to the power i k delta omega q t plus k delta phi q. Now, I have to do this summation and now the advantage of sum, summing here it is not showing, but advantage of summing k from minus n to plus n is that I know what the answer is. So, these summations I mean I am sure we might have done uh, many of these in 11, 12 maybe in BSc or something right. The summations are all nicely worked out and it is known that sum over k equal to minus n to n e to the power i k alpha is equal to 2 multiplied by sum over k equal to 0 to n cos k alpha minus 1. And then this you might think one summation is leading to another summation. So, what is the big deal? The big deal is that this summation is also known as you are going to see, but let us first write it this is what it will be ok. You have this outside the bracket inside the summation of exponential terms becomes summation of cosines and also uh, sum over this uh, domain changes right. It was minus n to plus n now it is going to be k equal to 0 to n. So, if you took only capital N then we would have this trouble you cannot even write n by 2. So, that is why we want uh, 2 n plus 1 modes. Okay. So, now all we need to know to go further is what is the summation of cosine terms? This is the summation of cosine terms. Does it look very nice? But that is what it is, what can we do? All right. So, I am going to uh, rush through the next steps. You can do the math if you want, it is not all that difficult. So, this is what we substitute, we substitute for the summation and then we put alpha equal to delta omega q t plus delta phi q. So, in terms of alpha this is the expression that we get ok. You get something like e 0 e to the power i omega t and you understand that the moment uh, finally, we do not want to work with uh, field right. We want to work with intensity. The moment we want to work with intensity this e to the power i omega t is just not going to be there because we will multiply it by its complex conjugate that term is not going to appear. So, eventually we do not have to worry about it. We do have to worry about this uh, sin 2 n plus 1 alpha by 2 divided by sin alpha by 2 this term ok. So, let us write it in a little easier form what is 2 n plus 1 2 into small n plus 1 what is that 2 n plus 1 what is that number. The answer is there in the slide. Yeah, total number of longitudinal modes, right? So, the other way we write it is capital N. So, now we have uh, the job of this small 2 n is uh, small n is done. Let us write it in terms of capital N and this is what we get and here on the quality of slide also starts getting a little better ok. So, we get E equal to E 0 e to the power i omega 0 t multiplied by sin capital N multiplied by sum of the uh, sum of delta omega and delta phi divided by 2. Yes. Sir, uh, you have considered that all at all frequencies the contribution to the electric field is same, the amplitude is easier. Yes. But uh, is it really? Uh, so, as I said eventually it will not matter because you are going to do Fourier transformation right. You can add on uh, the uh, amplitudes at that time. But uh, the Fourier coefficients if we are talking about them um, that coefficient value should be different. If we want that is true, but then uh, there is a way out there ok. So, this is what we end up with. The form of function is something like if you are talking about intensity sin n x by sin x whole square. Okay. What is x? x is this delta omega t plus delta phi divided by 2 and plot of sin n x by x sin x I encourage you to do it using uh, whatever graph plotting software you want to use. You will see this is what you get and this is a kind of function that we encounter everywhere. 
whenever we use optics. One thing we should not forget is that this is a periodic function. I have drawn only one. Well, it is not going to be one, it is going to repeat. So, you are going to get this and this is what I was saying. The picture we drew earlier was not completely correct in the sense that you do not just get a pulse, you get like this small you can call after pulse if you want. Okay? But the issue is even this picture is drawn using a comparatively smaller number of uh, smaller values of capital N. When we really work with ultra short pulses, this duration is so small that in the same scale it is very difficult to see capital T and TP. You get to say TP only when you zoom in into, into one pulse. Okay? So, this is what it is. So, do not forget what is the x axis, what is the y axis here. Uh, so, this is what you get. Now, I have given you the answer already. Now, let us see if we can derive it. So, first let us worry about repetition rate. What is the meaning of repetition rate? We can say it is time between two maxima. Where will the first maximum occur? Sin square n x divided by sin square x. Where will that have maximum value? Of course, for that we need to work out limits and so it is difficult, right? Because it is some it might sound like there is a discontinuity when x equal to 0, but it is a removable discontinuity, right? This point here, if you think that point is going to be actually 0, is not it? 0 by 0 kind of situation, not 0, sorry, 0 by 0 is what you will get, but that discontinuity is something that you can remove. So, first maximum will occur where delta omega q t 1 plus delta phi q equal to 0. Where will the next one occur? Second maximum. I okay, will give you the answer when it is 2 pi, does it make sense? Right? Okay. Just plug this into this expression and you will get the answer at 0 and at 2 pi. So, now if I ask you what is capital T? Capital T you can get by uh, capital T is basically T 2 minus T 1. Okay. And since it is a periodic function, uh, this separation will be same for any pair of consecutive pulses you take. Right? So, uh, what is T 2 minus T 1? The subtract delta omega q is constant. So, what do you get if you subtract one from the other? You get delta omega q multiplied by T 2 minus T 1 and now see delta phi q would cancel each other the moment you take a difference. That is exactly what will not happen if delta phi is also a function of time. Right? You can do this only because delta phi is not a function of time and it is constant everywhere. So, what do you get? Delta omega q multiplied by T 2 minus T 1 is equal to 2 pi. And what is that T 2 minus T 1? That is capital T time between two pulses. This one occurs at time T 2, this one occurs at time T 1. Okay. x axis is time multiplied by something right from there you can always convert to time. So, T 2 minus T 1 is equal to capital T. So, I can do it like this difference in time capital T is equal to T 2 minus 1. So, you get delta omega q multiplied by capital T is equal to 2 pi. So, what is T? 2 pi divided by delta omega q. Right? Now, again we come back to uh, what we promised is going to be useful later on. So, later on time has come. What is delta omega q? Delta is difference, omega is angular frequency. So, it is difference in angular frequency between what and what? Two consecutive longitudinal modes, very good. And we already know some quantity associated with it. We know delta nu and what is the relationship between delta nu and uh, delta omega? We know that already. right? So, what we can say is we can write something like this 2 pi divided by 2 pi into delta nu q because delta omega is equal to 2 pi into delta nu. When you go from frequency to angular frequency that factor of 2 pi comes. So, you are left with 1 by delta nu q. What is delta nu q? Yes. So, now from there you get 2 L y c. 
right. So, we see that this repetition rate that we get has nothing to do with how many modes are locked. That is the uh, nice thing that comes out because otherwise it would have been a problem. How do you decide how many modes are uh, available for you? Can you decide? One thing that uh, is there is uh, what is the spectral bandwidth? Say uh, to start with let us say uh, your uh, spontaneous emission spectrum ok that is independent of anything else spontaneous emission. Then remember we had drawn a laser threshold where half width was uh, delta lambda right. So, where that laser threshold will be who determines that? If I can somehow increase decrease the laser threshold then I will have more modes that will uh, get locked. Are you following what I am saying? This figure, this here is your laser action threshold ok. Now, what I am saying is that my first thing that is important is which substance what is your active medium that would better have a broad enough spontaneous emission band. Okay. Then what I am trying to say is here I have placed the laser action threshold here. Is it in any way possible to push it further down? Remember laser action means you should have stimulated emission. Is there any way for a given substance that I can increase the uh, stimulated emission bandwidth? How can I do it? Exactly pump harder. If you pump harder then this threshold can actually go down ok because more molecules will be excited and so on and so forth. Do not forget the stimulated emission is like a uh, bimolecular reaction right bimolecular elementary reaction between uh, light and matter. So, you could think of doing that. Okay. So, that way you can get more uh, longitudinal modes and you can try to get shorter pulse. That is why in a tie sapphire laser you want to pump with a high energy. You want to pump if possible by 5 watt instead of 3 watt. You want to pump if possible by 8 watt instead of 5 watt to get shorter and shorter pulse. Of course, there are other issues damage is an issue. So, you have to take care of those, but the problem is if the repetition rate also depended on number of modes there would have been an issue is not it. Then you you do not want the repetition rate to change otherwise uh, synchronizing uh, electronics everything will change. So, it is good that repetition rate is just 12 by 6 nothing else matters. How hard you pump? Uh, nothing. Not so for pulse duration. Okay. So, for pulse duration uh, it is not very difficult to understand that what happens? Let us uh, start thinking a little qualitatively. Let us go back to this analogy of people running around a field. So, when they come together that is the pulse maximum right. If you want a pulse of short duration then they have to scatter faster ok. Now, if you have more and more people running with different speeds will you agree with me that scattering is more efficient there yeah. In fact, if you look at these interferograms where you mix uh, many waves you will see that more the number of waves sharper is the fall off right. That is why you need more pulses to get a shorter pulse duration that is a qualitative understanding. Now, let us see what we get from here ok. How do I define pulse duration? So, as we are see practically we always talk about full width at half maximum and when we finish this discussion today we will be talking about full width at half maximum, but for now it is 
easier for us if we consider all the normal modes that are there. Otherwise, again pulse shape and all that will come. So, if you want to consider all the longitudinal modes that are there, you want to go from here to here, right? So, let us see what is the time about this big maximum where your intensity becomes 0 before and after, okay? Difference between these two times is going to give me pulse duration. Remember, this pulse duration is not full width at half maximum. So, if this is 200 picosecond, that means uh, 200 frame per second, then full width at half maximum is perhaps 100, perhaps less depending on the shape of the pulse. Okay? And this is where shape of the pulse also becomes important. right? If you want to go full width, uh, do you agree with me that ratio of full width at half maximum and full width at say 10th maximum is not going to be the same for a Gaussian pulse and a Lorentzian pulse, right? they will be different. So, right now we do not worry about all that, we just talk about the pulse duration. So, when will they become 0? When the numerator is equal to 0 and the denominator is not. So, that condition is sin n delta phi t plus delta delta omega t plus delta phi by 2 equal to 0. Okay. This is one condition. Well, sin x equal to 0 when? When x equal to 0? Next time, when does it become 0? Yeah, pi. Okay. So, I can put time as t1. I can say this is t1. For t1, this thing is equal to 0. For t2, the next one, it is equal to pi. So, again from here, you can find out t2 minus t1 very easily and that is going to be Tp, the pulse duration. Yeah. So, do it. This is what you get Tp equal to T2 minus T1. Just subtract. What will you get? You will get 2 pi divided by n delta n uh, delta omega. Is that right? Yeah. Just uh, simple algebra, right? Again, delta omega what does uh, by now we are uh, sensitized to this issue whenever we see delta omega what should we do and here this is 2 pi divided by delta omega it's even more tempting go over to delta nu and you know the expression for delta nu it turns out to be 12 by nc so just this n is different so we are vindicated you need more number of pulses so that this uh, more number of uh, or not pulses sorry more number of longitudinal modes because it this n comes in the denominator okay larger denominator smaller tp that's what you want all right but then uh, we might as well have stopped here if we wanted to have only a theoretical but finally we want to uh, go over to something that is more tangible who is going to count the number of longitudinal modes it may not be all that easy okay but there may be something else that is easier. So, let us use another expression and you might have forgotten because we have talked about it uh, I think couple of modules earlier. Remember this? In fact, we talked about it at the beginning of the previous module as a recap. We worked out that number of total number of longitudinal modes capital N is given by 4 L delta lambda divided by lambda 0 square. Okay. So, might as well uh, substitute this. So, when you substitute what do you get? You get pulse duration is equal to lambda 0 square divided by 2 C delta lambda. Okay. What is delta lambda? In the treatment that we have followed, delta lambda is half width at half maximum of the uh, spontaneous emission band, but what is more important for us is that it is the half width at the base of the stimulated emission band. Half width at base. Yeah. Okay. So, now we have something tangible, right? We can measure spectrum. When we measure spectrum, we know what lambda 0 is, we know what delta lambda is. So, it is uh, not very difficult to figure out what the pulse width is going to be. 
that is why in our lab we do not bother about uh, trying to measure the uh, pulse width in time domain. As I said shortly we are going to discuss how to do it. So, you see what the problem is we are talking about short pulses 100 frame to second, 50 frame to second, 6 frame to second. How will you measure? You cannot see it on an oscilloscope directly. Okay. So, uh, you have to apply some kind of a trick and the trick that is applied invariably depends on some instrument that was made long long ago. Okay. Let me digress a little bit. I lo love digression. What is the speed of light? Is that large or is that small? How do you know it is correct? Who told you that that is the speed of light? I mean textbooks told you, but how do they know? Somebody must have measured it, right? So, if I want to measure what is the speed of Shomodipto, it is very easy. I can do it using perhaps my uh, wristwatch. Who, what is the wristwatch or what is the stopwatch that allowed somebody to measure the speed of light? Again, everybody has studied in the 9, 10, 11, 12 sometime in physics. Michelson interferometer, the moment I say it you will know. It is just that you might know it as Michelson interferometer, Michelson interferometer, right. So, in Michelson interferometer if you remember monochromatic light was used and there was a relationship from which you could find out the uh, from path length. So, basically what Michelson interferometer does is it generates a map like we generate a map of uh, the uh, fluorescence decay that takes place in femtosecond by monitoring second harmonic uh, intensity as a function of delay time. So, Michelson interferometer also generates a map okay, and it sort of stretches out, does not stretch out, it behaves as if it stretches out and creates a wave whose wavelength is correlated with the wavelength that falls on it. Okay, there is a relationship, it is not very difficult to work out. So, that is how speed of light was determined. So, now once you know the speed of light, you can determine uh, small times using Michelson interferometer kind of arrangement. We will talk about that, but it is a little cumbersome. And I do not know how many chemistry ultra fast labs in India at all have what is called an autocorrelator. It is called an autocorrelator, the instrument by which you measure the pulse width is called an autocorrelator and we are happily working in this field without ever having had one. Why? Because this is our saving grace. T p is 4 L delta lambda divided by lambda 0 square. So, if delta lambda because uh, if delta lambda is of some value in principle we can calculate what the pulse width is. Right. If you do not want to calculate what the pulse width is, we can get some qualitative value. We know from our experience that for a 100 femtosecond pulse laser, your uh, full width at half maximum has to be 12 nanometer or so. For the amplifier, which is a shorter pulse laser, full width at half maximum has to be more. Okay. This is the relationship that one can use and work happily in an ultra fast lab without ever having to buy an autocorrelator. All right. But then uh, it may not be as simple as I have uh, proposed it to be because do not forget what this delta lambda is. It is the basal width, right. One thing that we have not considered so far at all is the spectral shape that is actually important. So, let us close today's discussion by talking about it. So, what we are essentially talking about is transform limited pulses and I have goofed up a little bit on this slide unfortunately, bear with me. See what are we saying? We are saying that a broader spread in wavelength and therefore, energy corresponds to a shorter spread in time. Okay. That is essentially something that is absolutely correlated with uncertainty principle once again. Greater uncertainty in time is associated with lesser uncertainty in energy and vice versa. Okay. So, uh, 
these are called transform limited pulses. Of course, this is the best case scenario. You might have a bandwidth, a full width of maximum of 12 nanometer, but not 100 femtosecond pulse if something else is wrong. Right now, we are talking about the best case scenario. So, let us see why they are called transform limited pulses. Let us start talking about a Gaussian pulse in time domain. Okay, this is a Gaussian function. If I want to know its spectrum, if I want to know what that pulse looks like in frequency domain, what do we do? We do Fourier transformation. And when you do Fourier transformation, what kind of function do you get? Another Gaussian. Okay? And this thing that I had by mistake written earlier is that uh, full width half maximum, delta omega full width half maximum, that is given by this kind of a function. Okay. What is the uh, spread in time for this Gaussian function in time? The spread is given by 2 tau square root of ln 2. All right. Now, if I multiply that two together, full width half maximum in time domain multiplied by full width half maximum in frequency domain, what do I get? I get 0.441. So, all this tau and everything cancel off, ln 2 is a number. Okay. So, a transform limited pulse which is Gaussian is going to obey this. So, if your pulse is Gaussian, then it is very nice. Again, no need of an autocorrelator. The only thing to remember is you should talk about delta nu, not delta lambda. Okay. Lambda is an inverse scale, right? That is why that lambda 0 square factor comes. So, delta t full width half maximum in time multiplied by full width half maximum in frequency gives 0 0.441 for Gaussian for a transform limited pulse. So, so what is it? Why do people buy autocorrelators in the first place? So far, I have told you that we are happily uh, working without an autocorrelator, without having to spend those few lakhs of rupees that are required to buy it or build it. Why do people buy at all? They buy it because not all pulses are transform limited pulses. This is sort of the theoretical limit. Okay? And then let us now close by uh, showing you something else. This number 0 0.441 that we got, why did we get 0 0.441 and not 0 0.8? Because we worked with Gaussian function. Okay? So, similarly, this has been worked out for other pulses as well and these are the numbers. Forget about this for now. For a square pulse, the product has to be 1. For a diffractive pulse, 0 0.886. Gaussian we have discussed already. For hyperbolic second, these are all different shapes, right? And there is no guarantee that one shape uh, that always you are going to work with Gaussian kind of pulses. Lorenzian, 0.221. See, Gaussian and Lorenzian we are very familiar with. See the difference is one is half of the other. Exponential, two sided exponential, the product is 0 0.142. Right? So, depending on what kind of pulse you have, what kind of spectrum you have, in principle you can work out the pulse width if you just look at the spectrum provided you are working with transform limited pulses. Okay? So, that is what uh, we wanted to discuss today. Next, let us see how to achieve, we have talked about mode locking, we have talked about the theory, but how do you do it? That is what we are going to discuss in the next few modules.